not being good enough. When I won the Oscar, I thought it was a fluke. I thought everybody would find out, and they'd take it back. They'd come to my house, knocking on the door. Excuse me, we meant to give that to someone else. That was going to Meryl Streak. You think, why will anyone want to see me again in a movie? And I don't know how to act anyway, so why am I doing this? Do you feel as though you aren't good enough? Guess what? You're not the only one. The other day, I wrote the following to a fellow blogger. There are a lot of topics I could write about, but there are already so many books out there. Sometimes I'm like, what's the point? He replied, I know the feeling of, what's the point? Everything worth saying has already been said, and who am I to write about it anyway? What have I achieved so far? Ah, uh, well, I guess it's natural. Good to know that we're not the only ones struggling. Whether or not you're aware of it, millions of people feel the same way. The feeling of not being good enough alone must have killed more dreams than anything else. And who has never felt that way? Here is a non-exhaustive list of how I felt in my life. I'm not a good enough writer. I'm not charismatic enough. I'm not competent enough. I'm not confident enough. I'm not courageous enough. I'm not disciplined enough. I'm not good enough at public speaking. I'm not handsome enough. I'm not inspiring enough. I'm not interesting enough. I'm not making enough money. I'm not muscular enough. I'm not patient enough. I'm not perseverant enough. I'm not proactive enough. I'm not productive enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not taking enough action. I'm not tough enough. I'm not working hard enough. My English isn't good enough. My Japanese isn't good enough. And my memory isn't good enough. And I could go on. People who feel they aren't good enough tend to have low self-esteem. They focus on what they aren't good at while filtering out all the things they are good at. Try complimenting them, and all you'll hear is, it's no big deal. Worse, they may even think you're being polite or trying to manipulate them. These people have a hard time accepting compliments. Instead of a simple thank you, they return the compliment or downplay their role. Perhaps you're acting the same way. See if you do one of the following things when receiving a compliment. 1. Dismiss the whole thing as being no big deal. Anybody could have done it. 2. Talk about all the things you did wrong while explaining what you could have done better. 3. Try to return the compliment. Thank you. I think you did a fantastic job, too. Notice your inability to accept a compliment 100% in the three cases above. You may not only brush off your accomplishments, but also magnify every single of your failure to reinforce the case you aren't worthy. You keep a long list of your failures, unwilling to let go of them as they fit your story. Who would you be if you were no longer the man or woman who's never good enough? As strange as it may seem, there's something scary about that. At least, the certainty of not being good enough gives you some comfort. Imagine what would happen if you released the hold you have on your story, try something you've always wanted to do, and fail. What you suspected for a long time would become true. You aren't good enough. Or worse, what would happen if you were to succeed? How would that fit into your story? Remember, your brain is biased towards negativity. Adding your own bias will certainly not help you feel good about yourself. The fact is, you do most things well. Although a lack of experience, interest, or talent may explain why you aren't doing as well as you would like to in certain areas, it has nothing to do with you not being good enough. How to use the feeling of not being good enough to grow? Not feeling good enough is a sign of low self-esteem. Many people experience low self-esteem in various degrees. I certainly do. For some, every single thing they do is insufficient. For others, they feel inadequate only in certain situations or areas of their life. Wherever you are on the self-esteem spectrum, you can probably benefit from a boost in your self-esteem. Identifying what triggers your feelings of inadequacy. The first step is to find out what triggers these feelings. What thoughts are you identifying with? Which areas of your life are concerned? Take a few minutes to write down the following. The situations in which you feel like you aren't good enough, and the thoughts you identify with, your story. Keeping track of your accomplishments. The second step is to keep track of your accomplishments. Not feeling good enough often results from the biased view you hold about yourself. You focus on your shortcomings, failing to acknowledge your successes. People with healthy self-esteem tend to look at themselves in a more objective way, acknowledging both their shortcomings and their strengths. 
to improve your self-esteem, start acknowledging all the things you're doing well. The following exercises will help you do that. Exercise 1. Create a win log. One of the best ways to acknowledge your accomplishments is to write them down. For this exercise, I encourage you to use your dedicated notebook. 1. First, write down everything you've accomplished in your life. Come up with a list of 50 things. If you run out of things, write smaller accomplishments. This will help you realize how much you've already accomplished. 2. At the end of each day, write down all the things you've accomplished that day. It can be simple things such as, I woke up on time I exercised and I ate a healthy breakfast. Try to come up with 5 to 10 things each day. Exercise 2. Fill up your self-esteem jar. An alternative is to write down each thing you've accomplished on separate pieces of paper and put them into a jar. Here are a few recommendations to ensure you make the most out of this exercise. Make sure your jar, or any other container you use, is in a visible location. The best location is probably on your desk. The second best location is your bedroom. Select a container you like. Choose a design you're fond of. It's all about your self-esteem, so anything that makes you feel good is advisable. Make sure it is transparent so that you can see it filling up. Give it a positive name. For example, my self-esteem jar, declaration of love to myself, etc. Write your accomplishment on a paper you love. For instance, use different colors so that when the jar fills up, it creates something pleasant to the eye. One idea would be to use origami paper. Write with your favorite pen. The idea is to show more respect towards yourself by acknowledging your multiple accomplishments. Exercise 3. Create a positive journal. You can also create a journal to write down every compliment you received that day. Your colleague told you your shoes look nice. Write it down. Your friend complimented your hair. Write it down. Your boss told you how well you did at a task. Write it down as well. Don't question the sincerity of these compliments. Always assume they are genuine. The idea is to train your mind to focus on the positive things that happen in your life. They are happening whether or not you acknowledge them. Here is how to make the most of that exercise. Buy a notebook you like, personalize it, add stickers, draw something, add pictures, or use different colors. Don't want to do any of this stuff. That's fine as well. It's your journal. Keep it with you carry it with you, and look for new compliments to add to your amazing collection. Optional. Review it every day, go through old entries, and mentally thank people who complimented you. You can say, thank you asterisk insert name asterisk, I love you. Feel free to read the old entries in the morning, in the evening or both, or whenever you feel like it. It's up to you. Again, this is your journal. These are just suggestions. Whatever works for you learning to accept compliments. Chances are, you have difficulties accepting compliments. Do the following sentences look familiar? It's never a big deal. Everybody could have done it. It's because so and so helped you. I could have done it better. Here is a great reason why you should accept compliments. Because the person who made the compliment wants you to receive it, not to flush it down the toilets. Imagine you just gave a gift to someone. How would you feel if that person, after opening the box, dropped the gift to the floor, stepped on it, and threw it away? You won't like it, would you? Sadly, that's what we often do when we receive a compliment. When we refuse to accept a compliment, we are disrespecting the person who went out of their way to deliver it. Wouldn't you want your compliment to be accepted wholeheartedly? Exercise 1. Accept compliments. This simple exercise will help you accept a compliment. Whenever someone compliments you, say the following. Thank you, asterisk, insert the person's name, asterisk. That's it. There is nothing simpler. No, thank you, but thank you, you too, or it wasn't a big deal. Simply say, thank you. Here is how to make the most of that exercise. Say thank you out loud and clearly. You may discover you have the tendency to repress your feelings and end up saying thank you almost mechanically. In fact, you may realize you've never really said, thank you, with all your heart. Let it sink in. Before you start a new sentence, give space for the feeling of gratitude to express itself. Don't downplay the compliment or explain why you're worthy or unworthy of it. Tell it the way you feel it. Show your appreciation by telling the person who complimented you how you feel. 
you may experience resistance. Many of us have difficulties expressing gratitude because our pride prevents us from doing so. After all, we're strong and don't need anybody's help or compliments, do we? We don't want to feel vulnerable. If you experience resistance and find the exercise difficult, recognize this is normal. Your ability to accept a compliment can be a good indicator of your level of self-esteem. Practice accepting compliments and allow yourself to feel vulnerable. Accepting your worthy of compliments will help you boost your self-esteem. Exercise 2. The Appreciation Game The purpose of this game is to learn to appreciate things in yourself you didn't previously acknowledge or like. It will work well if you have a partner you can play the game with on a regular basis. Tell your partner three things you appreciate in them and ask them to do the same. Be as specific as possible and don't worry about coming up with big things. Here are some examples. I appreciate that you prepared breakfast this morning even though you were in a rush. I appreciate that you picked up the kids today. I appreciate the way you always listen to my problems after work. To go further, self-esteem is a complex topic. It affects a lot of people and is often misunderstood. Overcoming low self-esteem takes time and effort. If you regularly feel you aren't good enough, I encourage you to refer to the following books. If, upon reading these books, you realize you have severe and chronic self-esteem issues, you may want to consult a specialist. The Six Pillars of Self-Esteem by Nathaniel Brandon, Ph.D. Breaking the Chain of Low Self-Esteem by Marilyn Sorensen, Ph.D. Low Self-Esteem, Misunderstood and Diagnosed Why You May Not Find the Help You Need by Marilyn Sorensen, Ph.D. Below is a brief summary of some of the main ideas in each book. In his book, The Six Pillars of Self-Esteem, Nathaniel Brandon identified six practices or pillars of self-esteem you can work on to develop a healthier self-esteem. 1. Living Consciously In Nathaniel Brandon's words, to live consciously means to seek to be aware of everything that bears on our actions, purposes, value, and goals to the best of our ability, whatever that ability may be, and to behave in accordance with that which we see and know. 2. Self-acceptance is choosing to value yourself, to treat yourself with respect, and to stand up for your right to exist. Self-acceptance is the basis upon which self-esteem develops. 3. Self-responsibility is realizing no one is coming to save you and you are responsible for your life. It is accepting that you are responsible for your choices and actions. You are responsible for how you use your time and for your happiness, because only you can change your life. 4. Self-assertiveness means honoring your wants, needs, and values, and seeking appropriate forms of their expression in reality. 5. Living purposefully is to use your powers to achieve the goals you have selected. In other words, it's your ability to set and achieve goals in every area of your life. 6. Personal integrity is behaving in a way that matches your ideals, convictions, and beliefs. It's when you can look at yourself in the mirror and know you're doing the right thing. In Breaking the Chain of Low Self-Esteem, Marilyn Sorensen provides a great overview of what self-esteem is and how it works. The author explains that low self-esteem stems from the negative perception you hold of yourself, a perception that is largely, if not entirely, based on your negative interpretations of past experiences. This distorted perception of reality leads you to experience fear and anxiety. Your family environment may have played a big part. Perhaps your parents have repeatedly put you down, making you feel as though nothing you did was ever good enough. You may now firmly believe you are less worthy than others. As a result, you filter everything based on this negative image of yourself. It's as if you were looking at reality through tinted glasses, glasses that discard praise and compliments, remembering only criticisms. The examples in her books will help you understand how self-esteem issues manifest in real life. In addition, Ms. Sorensen provides dozens of practical exercises to help you become more aware of your self-esteem issues and provide you the tool to develop a healthier self-esteem. Being defensive Our love of being right is best understood as our fear of being wrong. Do you constantly justify yourself? Are you offended whenever someone insults you or disrespects you? 
there are very specific reasons why you get defensive. By becoming conscious of these reasons, you'll learn a lot about yourself and be able to let go of that desire to defend yourself. First, let's see why you get defensive. Why you get defensive. The need to defend yourself stems from your desire to protect your story or your ego. Every time your ego is threatened, you are triggered and feel the need to defend it. I believe there are three main reasons why you are triggered. One, there is part of truth in what you were told. Two, you believe there is part of truth in what you were told. Three, a core belief you hold has been attacked. Note that because we all have different stories, what triggers you might not trigger someone else. One, there is part of truth in what you were told. Someone mentioned something that is true about you and it hurts. For instance, he or she may accuse you of procrastinating on a certain project. Your inability to accept that truth is the reason you become defensive. When that topic is brought up, it triggers emotional reactions such as anger, denial, or self-criticism. Two, you believe there is part of truth in what you were told. You were told something you believe to be true and feel hurt. In this case, the criticisms you received may be unfounded, yet you still feel hurt. Why is that? It's because what you were told confirms the disempowering beliefs you hold about yourself. For instance, let's say you believe you aren't good enough. This belief pushes you to work harder than anybody else. Now, how would you feel if someone accused you of being lazy? You would feel offended, wouldn't you? However, that wouldn't be because you're actually lazy, but because of your belief that you should work harder. 3. One of your core beliefs has been attacked. Someone directly or indirectly attacks one of your core beliefs, and you feel the need to defend yourself. This could be a religious belief, a political belief, or a more general belief about the world or yourself. The more attached you are to this belief, the stronger your emotional reaction will be. Here is a great example. Because they believed Donald Trump was evil, some liberals had strong emotional reactions after he was elected president. Some shouted and even became violent. On the other hand, many conservatives were delighted by Trump's victory. How come people can react so differently to the same event? This is because of their core beliefs. Both Democrats and Republicans strongly identify with their political beliefs. This led hardcore Democrats to burst into tears and hardcore Republicans to rejoice. Whenever a belief you're strongly attached to is attacked or challenged, you'll experience an emotional reaction. The deeper the belief is, the stronger the emotional reaction will be when it is attacked. An extreme example would be someone ready to kill anybody who dares to criticize his or her religion. How to use this emotion to grow? Look at the situations that triggers you. Whenever you feel offended, ask yourself why. What belief led you to defend yourself? Can you let go of this belief? And is this belief really true? By doing this, you'll learn a great deal about yourself. You'll be able to let go of beliefs that aren't serving you well, and you'll realize that, in most cases, you don't even need to defend yourself.